Hello, my name is Gillian Wiley and I work on the International Peace Studies Master's course at the Irish School of Ecumenics in Trinity College Dublin. I'm delighted to be taking part in this Sharing Perspectives module and I'm glad to have this opportunity to introduce the issue of human trafficking into your discussions about citizenship in contemporary Europe. I hope that as I answer my three key questions, you'll see why this issue has significance for your discussions and particularly your core question for this module, what or who I might suggest does the current framework of citizenship exclude? My three key questions are on this slide. Firstly, what is human trafficking? Secondly, what are the causes of human trafficking? And thirdly, how does human trafficking contribute to the politics of exclusion? So the first question, what is human trafficking? The issue of human trafficking features very strongly today in discussions, policies and actions taken by governments, international organisations, non-governmental organisations, various media and even in popular culture. The slide you see now is illustrative of just some of the many actors involved in the topic. This recent wave of concern with human trafficking dates from the end of the Cold War, but it is important to acknowledge that there is a prehistory to current debates. Over a century ago, the first movement against what was identified as the international traffic in women for the so-called white slave trade raised fears about the fate of migrant women in prostitution. These debates recurred at intervals in the work of the League of Nations and the 1949 United Nations Convention for the suppression of the traffic in persons and of the exploitation of the prostitution of others. There is now plenty of debate over the extent to which the white slave trade was a reality or whether it was something of a myth used by governments to control women's movement, labour and sexuality. You can read up on this history in books such as these by Limoncelli and by Gretchen Soderlund. What it is important to note from these earlier manifestations is that human trafficking was primarily understood as an issue of sexual exploitation affecting women and girls. Also, some of these debates about whether trafficking is an empirical reality or a discursive tool for disciplining migration do reappear in contemporary discussions, and I'll say more about this later on. After the 1949 United Nations Convention, Human trafficking was not a prominent feature of international debate and activity until the 1990s. Then, international advocacy, particularly by women's groups, and the changed post-Cold War context led to fears about a growth in human trafficking and the reinsertion of the cause on global agendas. In the context of forming a new convention on transnational organised crime in the late 1990s, the United Nations developed a new definition of human trafficking. This is encapsulated in the protocol to prevent, suppress and punish trafficking in persons, especially women and children, of the year 2000. It's now usually referred to in shorthand as the Palermo Protocol. You can read the full text if you follow this link. As you will see later if you follow the link, the definition in the Palermo Protocol is very wordy and convoluted. However, it boils down to three elements. Human trafficking is constituted by, firstly, an act, recruiting, transferring, transporting, harbouring or receiving a person. Secondly, a means, by means of deception, coercion, force, fraud, abuse of vulnerability. And thirdly, for an end the exploitation of a person for prostitution, sexual exploitation, slavery, servitude, their labour or their organs. It's notable that this new definition seems to mark a broadening of the concept of human trafficking. For example, more attention is paid to ends other than prostitution, such as labour exploitation, than was paid in the first anti-trafficking campaigns. However, sexual exploitation and the particular vulnerability of women and girls is still privileged, as for example in the title of the Palermo Protocol. The convoluted definition 
the necessity of all three elements being present, and the lack of legal clarity about what some of the concepts in the definition mean, for example, sexual exploitation or coercion, also makes the Palermo Protocol very hard to operationalise when it gets translated into domestic laws. The other important facet to remember is that the Palermo Protocol sits inside the United Nations Convention on Transnational Organised Crime. There are two other protocols in the Convention. One is on the trade in illegal firearms and the other is on the smuggling of humans. This positioning means, as many critics have pointed out, that the Palermo Protocol is primarily an instrument for states to pursue their interests in relation to security, law and order. It is not a human rights instrument and its protections for trafficking victims are very weak. I've mentioned that human trafficking returned to international agendas in the post-Cold War world and that it reflects tensions between issues of security and rights on state agendas. This leads us on to the exploration of question two. What are the causes of human trafficking? So question two, what are the causes of human trafficking? Perhaps before we go any further, it's important to say something about the nature and extent of human trafficking. As I said before, pressure for the formulation of the Palermo Protocol came partly from the identification of human trafficking as, in the words of Professor Louise Shelley, the fastest growing form of transnational crime based on a significant and tragic trade in people. Among the most commonly cited statistics on the scale of global trafficking is the United States Department's, the US State Department's annual trafficking in persons or TIP report. This is a copy from 2008. Over the last decade, the State Department has regularly reported that there are between 700 and 800,000 victims of trafficking annually, of whom around 80% are women and children. Importantly, there are significant problems with these figures and any other trafficking statistics. The methodology is often opaque. There are huge discrepancies between assumed cases and actual numbers of trafficking related prosecutions and the numbers counted depend on how complex definitions like Palermo or local laws are being interpreted by politically interested actors such as states or non-governmental organisations. Despite the agreed unreliability of the figures, however, numbers like those in the TIP report tend to gain traction and are frequently cited. They become, in Carol Vance's words, vampire numbers that are hard to kill off despite their acknowledged flaws. In all the difficulty over finding reliable numbers, what does seem to be clear is that the three element definition of trafficking, which is found in Palermo, is actually too rigid to capture the complexity of many people's migration stories. Several authors whose work will be recommended to go with this lecture, such as Ronald Weitzer, Bridget Anderson and Rudvitsa Andriasevich, all suggest that many migrants exist in and along a continuum of experiences or a continuum of exploitation rather than fitting a rigidly defined human trafficking box. To illustrate, I mentioned above that a partner protocol to Palermo is the United Nations protocol against the smuggling of migrants by land, sea and air. A smuggled person is defined as someone who has paid and consented to be moved illegally across international borders. So in legal terms, smuggling is differentiated from human trafficking because trafficking involves coercion, deception and exploitation of an unknowing migrant. The problem is that real world migration experiences do not fit these neat boxes. For example, people may start paying a smuggler but end up being deceived as to their destination or caught in exploitative conditions. You might be wondering why I have gone off at this apparent tangent when I'm supposed to be answering the question about the causes of trafficking. The reason is that I believe that migrant exploitation, which embraces mixed up elements of what might be understood as trafficking, smuggling or undocumented migration, is fundamentally caused by the migration, labour and visa regimes at work in our globalising world. It's not a coincidence that concerns about human trafficking were resurrected in the aftermath of the end of the Cold War. 
the end of the Cold War destabilised prevailing international knowledge about what constituted security threats and also shook about many settled international borders. Transnational organised crime was identified as one of several new security threats in that disruptive period. The end of the Cold War also saw the triumph, allegedly, of capitalism and the intensification of processes of neoliberal economic globalisation. Yet, globalisation contains a great contradiction. It is premised on the idea of open markets, but developed states extend that openness only to capital, goods and services. People do not move freely. Visa and border regimes enacted by the European Union or the United States, for example, cherry-pick highly skilled migrants from the global south, but maintain a fortress-style system against others. Migrants exercising their human agency in search of better or peaceful lives are often caught in the netherworlds of irregular movement as a consequence. This is a key cause of migrant exploitation in my mind, but it should be noted that other analysts would privilege other explanations. In particular, there is a strong focus from many feminist anti-trafficking non-governmental organisations on gender inequality and demand for sexual exploitation as the underlying cause of human trafficking. They would argue that it is men's power to control women's sexuality and their demand for paid sex that fuels sex trafficking and their policy position is therefore that men who buy sex should be criminalised as an anti-prostitution and anti-trafficking measure. This is often referred to as a neo-abolitionist or the Swedish model in reference to the European state which first enacted such measures. For me, this position is problematic as it makes no space for the agency of those who sell sex, neglects trafficking for other ends and focuses on bad men, traffickers, pimps and sex buyers who are responsible for trafficking and this lets state policies and the structural factors I discussed before slip out of focus. I think such factors have to stay in focus if we are to answer our third question. So question three, how does human trafficking contribute to the politics of exclusion? At first glance, it might seem counterintuitive to suggest that debates, policies and laws around human trafficking might contribute to the politics of exclusion in relationship to the citizenship question, who has a right to belong to the body politic? After all, although the Palermo Protocol is not set out as a human rights instrument, as regional and national laws developed in its wake, calls for a more human rights-based approach to identified victims of trafficking have intensified. So, for example, the Council of Europe, in its Convention on Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings of 2005, called on member states to accord many rights to victims in relation to protections, granting recovery periods, followed by possible leave to remain, and access to health, social and economic opportunities. A problematic underpinning here is that European states grant very few people the official status of victim of trafficking, and even when they do, and have accorded these rights to identified victims, it is usually on the basis of a requirement that they cooperate with policing authorities in relation to criminal cases against suspected traffickers. Despite this limit, it would seem there is scope, therefore, for some inclusion of identified victims of trafficking, which might set them one day on a path to citizenship. The dynamic that creates the twist here from potential inclusion to the politics of exclusion is to reconnect the discussion to the points I made before about the complex continuum of migratory experiences and exploitation and the politics of migration regimes. I would argue that the nation states of the developed world, and particularly of Europe in this case, deploy the categories of trafficked, smuggled, undocumented and illegal to categorise migrants and stratify their access to rights and belonging. The definition of human trafficking which casts the trafficked person, or more usually the trafficked woman or girl, as innocent because they were deceived, coerced and exploited, allows states to extend limited protections to the very few who are deemed to fit that box while categorising the rest as guilty, 
the knowingly smuggled, usually male migrant who does not deserve protections, but is rather to be kept at bay from border crossing and any potential inclusion. On the other side of the equation, the association of these practices with transnational organised crime enables states to ensure that those deemed to be either traffickers or smugglers are labelled in the public mind as organised criminal threats to European states. Security responses to them can therefore be legitimised. I think we've seen this at work in the last weeks in relation to the discussion of the EU's migrant crisis in the Mediterranean. Knowing that the states which negotiated Palermo put such efforts into distinguishing between trafficking and smuggling, it has been intriguing to see how easily the two concepts have been thrown together in European statements on the crisis. The headlines which have accompanied pictures such as these in the newspaper coverage have frequently referred to people traffickers and people smugglers interchangeably. By blaming bad traffickers and smugglers for the crisis experienced by those trying to cross the Mediterranean, EU leaders both seek to legitimise military and policing style responses to the crisis, such as destroying the traffickers' boats, and once again shift the blame, the focus of blame for the crisis from the consequences of their own Fortress Europe approach to migration. The EU sets out to rescue migrants caught in the ocean in the continuum of exploitation and to destroy the smuggling and trafficking chains. But it is failing to address the root causes of these crises, many of which can be traced to the exclusory approach to migration practised by EU governments in the name of fighting human trafficking. In closing, it's worth asking what would be the more ethical and practical European response to the reality of people who are caught at various points on this continuum of exploitation. What can be done rather than securitising and criminalising traffickers, smugglers and those many migrants who don't fit the human trafficking definition, or placing the barriers to fortress Europe ever higher and just compounding the problems? In a recent article in the Irish Times, the commentator Fintan O'Toole made these three suggestions concerning the immediate Mediterranean crisis. Firstly, we need a coordinated international strategy to deal with the needs of the many people on the move now. Secondly, European governments should talk calmly and humanely to their own people rather than allowing anti-immigrant rhetoric to be hyped up. And thirdly, governments should address the long-term structural causes of mass migration, which lie in global poverty, climate change, and the many crises the West has unleashed on the rest of the world through its military interventions. I think such suggestions are helpful in terms of directing our sights away from the limits of human trafficking discourse and its ironically exclusionary potential when in the hands of governments. Perhaps you could have a look at O'Toole's article at this link and use it as a basis for further discussion. This short talk can't do justice to the complexity of this topic and the many interesting debates that lie within it. A particularly helpful but also brief reading to sum up the intersections of trafficking, migration and citizenship is the paper by Anderson and Andrea Savich, which will be posted for you. I hope you enjoy fruitful seminars on the basis of this talk and its accompanying readings. Thank you.